Uh, please join me in welcoming Greg Berman. Uh, thank you. Uh, Julius, you're always so gracious in thanking everybody else. I wanted to pause just for a second and, and, and thank Julius uh, for pulling off this complicated <laughs> undertaking. <laughs> Julius has managed to pull it off with real grace and style. Um, so it's my pleasure this morning to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, someone that I've known and admired since uh, the 1990s, the great Lori Robinson. But before I get to Lori, and I uh, want to beg your indulgence, I want to talk for just a minute about history. Um, uh, history has been on my mind a lot, actually, in the run-up to this conference. Uh, I grew up about two and a half miles from here, and actually this hotel was the site of my, my prom, my junior year in high school. <laughs> I, won't, I won't say whether that was good history or not. Um, so, but that's actually not the history I want to talk about this morning. I, I want to talk a little bit about the history of the Community Corp movement, uh, if it can be called that. Um, I recently calculated that I've spent uh, more than 40% of my life working with Community Corps in, in one way or another. Uh, I started back in the early 1990s working for a guy named John Feinblatt on the planning of the Midtown Community Court before it was even opened. And since then, I've been fortunate to have a ringside seat for a number of very, what I would call, important moments in the, in the life of the community court movement. Uh, I was there when Attorney General Janet Reno toured the Midtown Community Court for the first time. I was there when uh, Tough on Crime New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani embraced the Red Hook Community Justice Center as a solution to, to crime in, in Brooklyn. Um, I was blessed to be able to visit Portland and, and Philadelphia and Hartford and, and see in person some of the first adaptations of this model outside of, of New York City. I've also had the pleasure of seeing the community court model spread with great fanfare uh, across the waters uh, in places like North Liverpool, and we're so fortunate to have Judge David Fletcher here with us from that project. <laughs> So all of these were key moments in the history of the community court movement, but, but those are not the moments that I want to talk about today. Uh, I want to talk about an important moment that didn't involve any political celebrities or media coverage at all. Uh, I'm talking about a, a key choice that was made in the early 1990s during Lori's first stint at the Justice Department. Back then, those of us who were involved with community court and in consultation with people like Lori and Tim Murray and Nancy Gist made a, what I think was a crucial decision. And what we decided was not to codify or standardize the community court model. Uh, we decided that we would be in the business of spreading ideas rather than rules and that we would never take a, community, uh, a cookie cutter approach to community courts. Now we made this decision for all sorts of good reasons. Um, most importantly, a belief that um, you know, the communities are fundamentally idiosyncratic and that if you're going to have the hubris to put community in your name, you have to take that concept seriously and adapt yourself to the unique strengths and needs of your local environment. It wasn't clear at that precise moment in time, but this decision was going to have far-reaching consequences for the field, both positive and negative. Um, there's little doubt that the lack of a standardized model has put a break on replication. Um, there are, in fact, other criminal justice reforms that have more replications than, than community courts. And there are, in fact, other reforms with more political power on the Hill. But that was never the goal of community court. Rather, the goal was to address discrete public safety problems in places like San Francisco and Seattle and Dallas, while serving as laboratories for ongoing innovation. And I would argue that the evidence uh, is that the community courts have done just this. As you will hear over the next couple of days, community courts have tested new approaches to the delivery of justice, improving the way that courts respond to minor offending, the way that they reach out to local residents, and the way that they work with social service providers. Community courts have also had a demonstrable impact on the ground, including reducing the use of incarceration in the Bronx, making justice speedier in Minneapolis, and reducing reoffending in Harlem. As powerful as these impacts have been at the local level, I think they add up to something much larger if you take a step back and view them in the aggregate. Now, I was thinking about this last week. I don't know how many of you read The New Yorker, but there was an interesting piece in The New Yorker last week uh, by Adam Gopnik, who's a wonderful writer. 
and he reviewed a, a number of recent criminal justice books, including Frank Zimring's new book on how New York got safe, which I recommend to you guys if you haven't seen it, because it goes some distance towards explaining the New York miracle, how New York has managed to reduce both crime and incarceration simultaneously over the last generation. So uh, I want to beg your indulgence and read just a kind of a lengthy quote from the piece by Gopnik. Um, so this is a quote by Adam Gopnik. Quote, epidemics seldom end with miracle cures. Most of the time in the history of medicine, the best way to end disease was to build a better sewer and to get people to wash their hands. Merely chipping away at the problem around the edges is usually the very best thing to do with a problem. Keep chipping away patiently and eventually you get to its heart. To read the literature on crime before it dropped is to see a kind of dystopian despair. We'd have to end poverty or eradicate the ghettos or declare war on the broken family or the like in order to end the crime wave. The truth is, a series of small actions and events ended up eliminating a problem that seemed to hang over everything. There was no miracle cure, just the intercession of a thousand small sanities." End quote. So I like this formulation very much, the intercession of a thousand small sanities, because I think that's what community courts perform every week, a thousand small sanities. So as you know, these projects aren't dealing with major index crimes. These aren't the kinds of legal matters that are going to end up getting discussed in, in law school textbooks or TV movies. But I think the community courts have shown that if we can get it right in these cases, if we can handle these defendants with dignity and respect, if we can figure out meaningful sanctions so that we are not just mechanistically defaulting to, to, to jail and, and fines over and over again, if we can do this, then we can begin to forge a more rational and effective criminal justice system.